Thanks very much. Thanks to Casey and Brian, Richard and uh, Natalie for organising this event. It's, uh, I, it, I'm very much enjoying it. It's a great pleasure to be in a room of uh, such uh, intelligent and opinionated <laughs> uh, people <laughs> and such good uh, speakers that I'm not quite sure I can quite live up to. Um, so I, I work on climate change um, and I'm interested in what we know and what we can know and what might constitute evidence, uh, um, what is relevant information um, about climate change. So I, I often talk about questions of how we interpret climate models and that's what I'm going to do today. But in, in that context, the, the existence of this camera here, so is it something that always makes me somewhat nervous. So I'm going to start with a, a number of comments, which I'll probably repeat at several points uh, through, the, uh, through the talk in the hope that it can't be cut out in, in some sort of way. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, <laughs> so it, I think it's really important for us to, to ask questions about how climate science works, where our information comes from, what is, what is robust, what is, is knowledgeable. But in doing that, we're kind of open to, to uh, people who want to manipulate uh, the, the public and the policy discourse on, on climate change. So, so my opening sort of starting point is nothing that I say is in any way a climate sceptic point of view. In fact, I would argue that the concerns about uncertainty uh, um, push us towards more uh, uh, more substantial policy. And in particular, I think we come down to, oh, I was thinking very much in, the, in uh, Tony's talk, but also in, in, in Catherine's talk. Um, there are things we, we really know, and things like energy conservation is something that we can really uh, trust in, we, we can really believe in. So we know with great confidence that uh, increasing greenhouse gases will lead to more energy in the uh, um, lower um, atmosphere and ocean system, and that that is likely to be generally related, over, particularly over longer periods, with increasing um, surface temperatures, and that increasing surface temperatures and all of the, and increasing heat in the system will change climate. We're looking at climate change both uh, in uh, the last hundred years and in the future, and we can expect that with very good and clear arguments to uh, lead to changes uh, and threats and impacts for societies around the globe and for global society. So questioning quite where we get our information and how we interpret models doesn't annul any of that. <laughs> we know we're in a difficult position. OK, so I, uh, when I um, got uh, the invite to come here, I, was, I thought, well, what, what do I want to talk about? And there's lots of kind of recent work that might be interesting to talk about, and particularly having heard uh, the talks the last uh, couple of days, some of them would be quite relevant. Um, there's w recent work that I've been involved in, in in this idea of tales of future weather, this storylines approach, which very much relates to some of the things that Rob was talking about yesterday, but going into the physical sciences, trying to put arguments, trying to uh, put physical arguments as to how systems could change. So that may, might be how the Indian monsoon might change, it might be how circulation patterns over northern Europe might change and what that means for water supplies or for flood protection systems and how one can use different types of models to fill in details of that sort of approach to guide decision makers. So, so there's kind of work there. Then there's kind of work which says well we've, we've had a lot of uh, analysis of observations but they tend to be focused on is climate change happening? Do we have evidence for climate change? And I think there's a, there would be value in shifting some of that uh, work on observations to say, what are the um, limits, uh, as, as Charles was talking about yesterday, the statistical limits given the timeframes of climate change to what we can identify in decision relevant thresholds. So not just try and say, has it changed? Which is in, in many ways a mitigation argument, but say, how has the thing that you are vulnerable to that impacts your decision, how has that changed? And uh, can we identify any change in that in a, a local scale or uh, a decision relevant scale? And so I kind of have um, some, some pieces of work on that. Um, but ultimately I decided to kind of throw that all out because I think with a group of what I, uh, with, there's, a, there's a large number of philosophers here and I'm interested in this what aspect of, of what constitutes evidence and and so I go back a little bit to some earlier work that I was involved with, in, uh, which relates to 
um, interpretation models. I think interpretation of global circulation models is uh, a, a big issue, and that's kind of what I want to concentrate on today. So in that context, I'd like, I'd like to sort of introduce, as I see it, some of the big issues in climate prediction. Um, so the starting point is uh, <coughs> perhaps the biggest issue in climate prediction is that it's an extrapolatory prediction. Um, we're trying to predict the behavior of the system under conditions that have never been experienced before. Um, I'm going to go through in the next couple of slides these uh, extrapolation points uh, again, so I won't label them too much here. But that means there's no possibility of confirming or verifying uh, a, a prediction. So we're not talking about statistical verification here. And that means that we rely on physical understanding. Our predictions of the future rely on physical understanding and an accurate representation of those understanding, of that understanding. Which, as I said, um, in a global sense, leading to warming and disruption, that's, that's very clear. If you want to know what's going to happen in Paris or um, uh, Delhi or Milton Keynes, then this becomes uh, uh, a little bit more difficult. So the second point I'd, I'd like to make is, is just that the uh, climate system is full of nonlinearities. There are many, many uh, complex nonlinear aspects of the system, and they're all interacting in nonlinear ways. Now, this will come back. Uh, I'll come back to that later. The third point is that it is a one-shot bet. Now, who mentioned this? I think Rob mentioned this uh, with slightly different terminology uh, uh, yesterday. Um, but, but the point is there will be only one 21st century. Um, so, in terms of confirming a probabilistic forecast, we're only going to get one point, and it's going to come too late um, to be of any value. Um, I'm specifically not going to look at Tony because I'm not quite sure what he's going to say to these things. Um, and then the, the fourth point is simply that, that this is not a general science question. Some of these things are, are not unique. Many of these things are not unique to climate change, but perhaps what makes them particularly special is that it's in the context of something which is relevant and urgent for wider society. So it's not a matter that we, are, we should be happy to just uh, bimble around and let science do its thing and spend 30, 40 years, as it, as it might be, looking for the luminiferous ether or, 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 um, or indeed looking for the planet Vulcan to exp explain why uh, we have anomalies in, in Mercury's orbit before we find out that actually there isn't a luminiferous ether. Actually, uh, there just isn't a planet Vulcan. We actually want to, to bring as much knowledge as, as we can together and do it, uh, do our science as quickly and as optimally as we can, because there's an urgency here. So I'll, um, <coughs> I was going to repeat those things in some sense, um, but I don't think that's really yeah, OK, I'll, I'll go through them very quickly. So I've talked about this lack of forecast uh, confirmation of verification. That's just uh, worth highlighting in a contrast to, say, weather forecasting. So we might use the similar sort of models to make weather forecasts as we do to make climate forecasts. But in the weather forecast, you're making a forecast every day. You have lots of pairs of forecast and verification. And so in some sense, you don't really care whether your model gets the physics right. It doesn't matter. It can get the physics completely wrong. But if what, if what comes out is a good forecasting system, then it is a good forecasting system. It, um, with climate, we just don't uh, have that. Um, so, so, we, so it comes back to this reliance on getting the physics right. That's where our belief in, in the climate models comes from. It's in their encapsulation of our physical understanding. Um, <clears throat> Then there's the model evaluation. Um, the, we talk about, we do go through a process of evaluating models, um, <clears throat> but we use observations of uh, the system in a state which is not what we're trying to predict. Um, <clears throat> so what I mean by that in a physical sense is the processes, the feedbacks that we see in the climate system over the 20th century or in paleo data will not we, we kind of know a priori. We know just by thinking about it that those are the, not going to be the dominant feedbacks that we see uh, in the 21st century. I mean, that's a bit strong to say they're not the dominant feedbacks, but um, there will certainly will be changes in those feedbacks as we go into the 21st century. So the observations that we use to try to verify our models, to tell us that our models are reliable, um, is, is, are not giving us the information that we want uh, about our models. Um, <coughs> 
So consistency between models and past observations may be considered a necessary condition, but it certainly isn't a sufficient condition. We then have a, an, an aspect of the model evaluations being somewhat in sample. So this is not that you take a complex model uh, <coughs> and uh, use all the um, data that you have, all the observations that you have, and make sure that it, it fits. It's not, it's not as categorical as that, but there is certainly a tendency as you develop models to try and make sure that it is reasonably good fit to the sorts of things you know about. So, and, and the data is used in that. The observational data is used in that. So then using that same data to say, well, this is a good model, um, creates a, 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 an in-sample um, problem. Um, and then we therefore rely on, on uh, model fidelity to be the... Uh, 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 the, the main point about why we should trust these models. Okay, so some words on what these models uh, are. What I'm concentrating here is uh, on things called um, global climate models. They used to be called, when I was younger, global circulation models. Um, <laughs> and at their heart, they uh, solve some really basic physics, so conservation of momentum, conservation of energy, conservation of mass, all of those I would have great faith in. Equation of state is a little bit more of an approximation, but, uh, but pretty close. And they do that by breaking the atmosphere and the ocean down into a, uh, a set of, uh, onto a grid uh, and solving these equations. So one can debate whether uh, we have the numerical capacity to do that, at what resolution, resolution you need to do that, and whether indeed the Navier-Stokes equations are soluble on a uh, rotating sphere uh, at all by, by this process. But those are the sort of philosophical questions I really don't want to get into. You, do get, you can do it pretty well. I'm willing to buy that. All of that's kind of, kind of okay. But there's another part of these models as well, because there are lots of stuff in here that is not uh, that does not come out of these equations, or at least not these equations on a grid of the sort of scale that we can uh, run on computers today. So these would include interaction of uh, radiation with the different gases in the atmosphere, uh, convective processes, precipitation, clouds, uh, surface gravity waves, land surface effects, you could add atmospheric, oceanic chemistry, these sorts of things that are happening on scales, on subgrid scales. Um, but are really important to get the, even the general circulation patterns right. So you have to have them in there, but you're not solving them as a solving a, a well understood physics. You're not saying this is the way the physics works. You're saying there seems to be, perhaps we understand some relationship between large scale circulations and these processes, and we're going to build a representation of how these, these interact so that we can uh, get a generally uh, good looking model. Now that raises certain issues, which I'll probably come to in, to a minute, in, a, in a minute, but I'll mention them now because they're in my mind. That raises a question. If, we, if you're wanting fidelity in your model as your, your basis of faith going forward, well, I kind of trust these equations. Are the representations of these aspects going to be appropriate as we go forward? Are they going to apply in a different state of the system? Um, well, we already have that, have that question maybe, maybe hanging there. So then, um, <clears throat> let's just put that in, into some context. So maybe I, I talk to camera. So one of the, I've, I've not got plots here that say how wonderful these models are. But these models are really quite wonderful. The, the achievement is, is kind of fantastic. Um, but concentrating on how wonderful these models are isn't kind of what I want to do in, in, in a meeting like this, because what we want to do is, is go forward. So, uh, so I'm going to um, point out just a couple of things about, about their errors, really. So one of the points here is that while they are all fantastic and remarkably close to reality in many ways, nevertheless, they are uh, substantially different from reality. So they're on substantially different attractors. And this is just a plot for the what's called the CMIP-5 uh, that uh, Kate, Kate mentioned, so the, an ensemble of global climate models. Uh, and this is the time series of global mean temperature through to the 20th century. Now, this is global mean temperature. Often what you see is global mean temperature anomaly. So you take off some uh, absolute value and they all sort of uh, match up and they all show a warming over the 20th century. But as you can see here, that, that there's a range of, of absolute global mean temperatures of, of around uh, three degrees here. Uh, the black line here is, is observations. Now, 
this is a this is a range of about three degrees when we're trying to predict a change of two to two to three degrees. This is this is quite big, and and you can just think about that a little bit. If you have a a model that's uh, a degree or, or cooler or de degree warmer, that kind of means that you you're, you're facing a situation where your tree line or your snow, your ice uh, uh, melting situation is either going to be in the wrong place, in which case the, the local feedbacks are going to be questionable as you go forward, or it's going to be in the right place because you've tuned the system and you tuned your parameterizations to put it in the right place, in which case the feedbacks going forward are going to be questionable because they're, they're not going to be realistic. So, um, so you have some, some questions there simply on a global mean temperature uh, level. Um, and you can see that uh, from uh, this comes from uh, further ago. This is CMIP3, so the 2007 results. Um, but if you look here, you have this little pop. This is the uh, uh, field of global mean temperature. Um, this is from observations. And uh, what I haven't got here is the, the fields for each of the different models. But if I'd had them there, you would find that they all look pretty much like this. Now, that's why, that's why it's such a fantastic achievement. <laughs> it, they all kind of look like this. But if you're trying to get decision maker information, decision maker for adaptation, so I'm wanting to know how big to build my storm drains or how big to build my uh, river flood defenses, well, well, there we've got, you, you need to look at, at uh, the details. And, and you've got places where you're two, three, four degrees cooler over, over land and places where uh, you're, you're substantially warmer over, over land or over, over oceans of a scale that really matters. So the, the, the models and the uh, and reality are different now. I know that uh, uh, people say that uh, all models are wrong, some models are useful, and, and that's kind of the uh, situation here. It seems clear to me that uh, these models are extremely useful in trying to help us understand the climate system, um, but, it's, uh, but that's not really what I'm going to talk about today. So to say they are useful in understanding the climate system uh, is, is fine and right, and they need more investment for that purpose. But how should we interpret them in terms of predicting the climate system? So if we can use these models to help us understand the processes that are relevant and then use that understanding to say something that is relevant for decision makers, uh, that's kind of fine. If you want to go straight from your models to decision makers about what's going to happen, well, that's that's going to involve some extra assumptions and, uh, and we maybe need to think about that. So one final thing, again, sort of kind of to camera. One of the points about these, this range of behavior is that they're all kind of different worlds. They have different global mean temperatures. All of them, all of them warm and show climate disruption in response to increasing greenhouse gases. So one of the conclusions from that is However different your, your, your climate, many, many different worlds, just in a vaguely Earth-like sense, are going to warm and show um, dangerous climate change in response to increasing greenhouse gases. So this is really an argument for mitigation. mitigation. This is an argument for really the risk is very, very, very robust. Um, it still raises the question of how we uh, interpret them for prediction. OK. So thinking about them as interpretation for prediction, we need to think about issues of model imp imperfections. And I perhaps uh, would like to put those down into two different categories. One would be simply model inadequacy. So the, the point here is that they don't include certain processes, things like uh, atmospheric oceanic chemistry. Some do, but not, uh, um, not all of them, and not necessarily in the ones that uh, are used for prediction. Stratospheric circulation, this idea of um, uh, parameterized processes being unlikely to capture in small scale feedbacks. So we just know the models uh, are not going to capture some things which we know to be important. And we just have to accept that. So we're going to have to interpret the models knowing that they don't allow for certain things. OK, that's, that's, that's just a, a background awareness. But there's also a, a separate aspect which we've termed model uncertainty. And this is the idea that you've got processes that are within the models but we don't know quite how to represent them. Um, and for, for those, you can look across models, uh, so in these multi-model sense, or you can take one model and change the way it represents uh, different processes to create what's called perturbed physics ensembles to explore that um, model uncertainty. And this is kind of a, a big business. There's lots of, lots of work on this, and indeed the, the CMIP5 uh, ensembles um, very much uh, play into that 
uh, that, that scenario. You're trying to understand the diversity of different uh, possible futures um, by uh, exploring this, this model uncertainty with multimodel or perturbed physics ensembles. OK, so where am I? I've got 20 minutes. OK, so I think I've got time for uh, a little bit of a diversion uh, at this point. So, so that's a focus on um, model uncertainty. That's really what I want to talk about. But I'm going to take this, this little diversion to think about what we mean when we talk about climate prediction um, and climate prediction and climate change. So the point here is that climate, climate is a distribution. Well, it is perhaps an attractor and a changing attractor. But let's think about that attractor, or, or, or maybe, it's, maybe it's just a, a, um, some sort of uh, behavior on some manifold. But let's, uh, let's, let's put those details to one side. You can collapse that into some sort of, of distribution, perhaps a multivariate distribution. And climate change is a change in that distribution. Now, that may mean a change in the mean, certainly in global mean temperature, and unexpectedly and, and in uh, regional temperatures, you would expect the, the mean to change. But climate change can be represented by any change in, the, in that distribution. Um, and so what we're interested in is, is uh, identifying that change in distribution. Um, so I've got some uh, plots here from a little bit of, of work that I did with uh, Joe Darren to try to understand what that might mean, particularly in terms of how we run ensembles of climate models. So uh, up until now, I've been talking about uh, model uncertainty. But of course, there is, this is a nonlinear system. You expect initial value uncertainty as well. And you can illustrate this with this. Well, I like this little system. This is a, a system um, called Lorentz uh, Lorentz 84 coupled to a Stommel ocean. So it's, it's got, only got five variables. This state space is only five, which is somewhat better than the GCMs, which have a state base of about 10 to the 5. So it's just, just a little bit easier and a little bit faster to run. Uh, and I don't, these, are, these, are, these are the um, atmospheric variables here. Uh, so in, in, in one attractor, this is another attractor. And these are the ocean variables. You don't need to worry what they are. This isn't a climate model. This is a climate-like model. It has characteristics of a climate model. It has fastly varying atmospheric variables. It has slowly varying uh, uh, ocean variables. It takes uh, 100, 100, 200,000 years to explore the attractor in the ocean variables. So if you imagine starting somewhere on this attractor and then changing the parameters of the model, like changing CO2, so that we're moving towards this attractor here. So you're going from here to here, but you're actually going from this point on this attractor, and you're coming here. And you, if you set up a 10,000 member ensemble from within that red dot, you can build a, uh, a time series of a changing distribution going forward. Or if you want to go the other way around, which is kind of uh, from this red dot to there, you will end up going this way. Now, this is just meant to illustrate the sort of problem we're looking at. So the reason you might want to go the other way is this is moving into a regime where, you, where it's more chaotic, where you have more variability, and uh, the opposite the other way around. And the point is you can, with this 10,000 member ensemble, you can then pick out how the climate changes. So if you ignore the, the orange line, if you just see this, uh, the blue shading, which gives this changing uh, PDF as you go forward, you can see at this point in time, the climate changes. Up to there, it's been a gradual shift. Up to, at that point, it's a sudden shift. That is a change in distribution. That is a change in the climate, and a very sudden change in the climate. If you take any single trajectory, which is what you would actually live through, well, it's very difficult. You can certainly see it there, but you can see it here as well. You can see it there. It's, a, it's all over the place. There's, there's natural variability. Identifying what is a climate change and what is a, uh, a natural variability within um, a, a background climate change is only something you can do with these large ensembles. So this comes to the parallel universes, the counterfactuals that we were talking about yesterday, um, which in terms of interpretive models I think becomes very important. And this uh, has been taken forward a little bit with Ed Hawkins at uh, Reading, um, <coughs> where, well, uh, Clara Dessa as, as well has, has done a, a lot of work in this area, but I want to share the work from Ed Hawkins where uh, we're looking here at the 20-year trend in winter temperatures over Europe. So this is starting from some state with a model that uh, lots of people don't like, but let's not worry about that for the moment. Um, <clears throat> and we're forcing it with 1% uh, per year increase in CO2 and looking at the trend over the first 20 years. Um, and this is the distribution in trend. So we're going from a trend of increasing 1 to a trend of decreasing 1 degree over this, this region, winter European temperatures. 
Um, and I would argue that that is a probability distribution conditioned on the model and the starting conditions. Starting conditions being you're in that kind of red dot. There's, there's uh, in initial value sensitivity within that red dot, but you know you're generally in that red dot. Now, the issue uh, that we looked at in this piece of work was we called that micro initial condition uncertainty, actually from some earlier work. If we start from another red dot, now this in, uh, in the case here, we're looking at a, a different ocean state from a background scenario where you just run the model continually to get some pre-industrial levels. So it's not somehow less likely, it's just some different ocean state. And then do the same experiment. Now we've got another 50 member ensemble going forward. Well, now we've got anywhere from half a degree to two and a half degrees. The point is that these are very, very different. The distributions going forward depend on the macro state of where you have your red dot, the macro state that you start from. Okay, so what's the point there? The point, there's two points there. One is that uh, that details of the macro state, details of quite the circulation patterns that you start your ocean models can affect the distribution going forward. Not just your particular trajectory, but the whole distribution going forward. Um, and the other point is about how we design our model ensembles. Um, typically in the multi-model ensembles, the big international ensembles, CMIP5, CMIP3, CMIP6 going forward, uh, you have a minimum of three uh, initial condition ensembles, typically up to about nine. This is simply not enough to quantify the change in climate conditioned on the starting conditions that they have within the model which raises some questions, whatever I say. It says, uh, reliable probabilities for future real world behavior based upon them, therefore seems challenging. I did try, I spent some time thinking about quite what terminology to use there, but since I... <laughs> I used many words there, but you may say hopeless. <laughs> but while we... <laughs> There's a lot of weight on the word reliable. Sorry? Yes. <laughs> okay. So back to okay. So 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 that's a context. This was that that's all about how could we tell climate change within a model? Forget about the model reality interface. And so we already have something of a barrier because uh, which we need to address in our model designs. Where are we? Half an hour. Okay. Um, so. The next stage would be how do we interpret multimodal ensembles? And I'm going to give some results from climateprediction.net because uh, it's because it's what I have. <laughs> so I was involved in setting climate, uh, climateprediction.net, but it's also the largest exploration of, of um, parameter uncertainty uh, in in the world. Uh, but it was done ten. 10 or so years, 10, 12 years ago, um, there's still an effort to try and explore model uncertainty, but it's perhaps gone down the agenda, I think, somewhat, and I don't think that's helpful. So climateprediction.net was this project we got to, to run very large uh, um, ensembles um, of climate models where you change the way the model represents certain particular aspects of the system. So you change parameters within those parameterizations. So the way clouds are represented, the way land surface is represented. Uh, and I'm going back right to the very first of these um, um, experiments from 2003, where it took a, 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 a reasonable model at the time, um, although it was, uh, you didn't have a full dynamic ocean, so you don't really need to worry about that. It has three phases. You have a calibration phase where you make sure the atmosphere in the ocean is uh, uh, in balance, you then run a control phase where you say you, you check that it's in balance and then you run a double CO2 phase and see how it responds to, to changing CO2 forcing. So this is not really a prediction because we're just looking at uh, double CO2. The interesting bit is that you can do that for any single model. Each of these is only 15 years. It took about, I can't remember when we started, about three, three hours. Actually, when we started a couple of days to run on a PC. Um, and it, it all got faster um, as time went by. So that's one of those might be a couple of days at that time. Now it might be an hour. 
Um, but the idea is you take the starting model setup and you change the way uh, different parameterization schemes, change the values of different parameters within different parameterization schemes, which gets you tens of thousands of models. And then the idea was for each of those, you'd run an initial condition ensemble, where I think we fell into exactly the same um, fault that I'm criticizing CMIP5 for, uh, because we actually only did up to about 10, and most of them were much smaller than that. So we suffered the same uh, problem. So. How did we perturb the parameters? Well, if you imagine parameter one and parameter two, this is the default value. Um, there was other work going on at the UK Met Office at the time where you'd, you'd say you'd change parameter one, take a low value and a high value, change parameter two and have a low value and high value, but you'd only change them one at a time. Um, we went further and tried to explore multiple um, combinations, but still in a factorial way. So we, we're not trying to fill in all space. We're trying to have a low value and a high value, but as many combinations across as many parameters as we could. And I think we're exploring about 21, maybe it was 29 parameters. So I think to have a thorough exploration, we'd need about 10 billion simulations. And we didn't get, quite get to that. Um, there's all sorts of issues on design. And the statisticians hate it, and they're wrong. I, I was going to say maybe they're wrong, but since we've <laughs> been opinionated, but they're just wrong and don't understand the problem. Um, <laughs> OK, so that leads you to a situation where you've got lots of simulations. That's what we had. We didn't have 10 billion. That was a little bit of a shame. Um, at, in terms of the first uh, publications on these results, we had uh, 2,500. Now got, well, I'm showing here 20,000. Um, for various reasons. Uh, and I'm going to show a region. So this isn't quite a decision uh, region, but imagine North these are both for Northern Europe. This is winter, this is summer. I'm plotting regional temperature change in response to double CO2 against regional precipitation change in response to double CO2. Remember, winter, summer. Uh, zero lines here, so what we see is that all of these uh, models uh, warm, and they all show increasing rainfall. Um, I could say more about that in winter. All of them warm, and some of them increase rainfall, and some of them decrease rainfall in summer. And there's 20,000, well, uh, I'm plotting 6,200 model versions where if there's initial condition, I'm going to take the mean. So having said the distribution is what mattered, I've now thrown away the distribution, and I'm just looking at the mean. <laughs> Never mind. For, for the moment, we, that's all we can do. Um, so the question is, what does that mean? So largely, what I would come, come down to at the end of this is, what does that mean? What can we get out of that? Um, and I think it's challenging. So the, the challenges are, firstly, that these are not independent samples. Um, we're starting from some point in parameter space. We're perturbing around that point in parameter space. Um, so th there's no sense in which these are independent samples of, of the future. So there's no reason to expect high density of points to, to relate to uh, higher probability. Um, and the same can be said of the multimodal ensembles, CMIP3, uh, CMIP5, where you have some of those points sort of plotted in a, a sort of comparative way there. Um, but the point is that they are all related too, not because of the same points in parameter space, but because despite what you may have gathered from uh, your interactions with climate models, they, they are actually quite social. They do talk to each other. They share information. They share pieces of code. The way of representing the system is not independent in these different models. So we have the same problem there. So there's a, there's a lack of independence. So I would argue, as a starting point, all you can really do is draw some sort of envelope around it and give it different names, which always helps in different papers. I called it a domain of possibility, a non-discountable envelope, which I like because the idea is this is the region that you can't discount as a possibility for the future. If you're going to trust any models, this is the, the regions you can't discount. But then when I present that to economists, or if, if an economist in the room say, this is ridiculous, what are you talking about, non-discountable? What discount rate would you use anyway? And it's, it's, so. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, there's a conflict there. Um, more, more accurately, I like this term, lower bound on the maximum range of uncertainty. I, I love this, but it doesn't roll off the tongue uh, quite so well. So the idea is we've done some exploration. This is, this is the maximum range of uncertainty that we've found. It could be smaller when we work out constraints. That's why it's the maximum range. On the other hand, we know that we haven't done a full exploration, so it's only a lower bound on the maximum range of uncertainty. Anyway, so that's what I would argue is, is, is all we've got. Um, how long have I got? Yeah, um, uh, 15 minutes. Oh, OK, that's great. Um, so 
what I've no idea what uh, Tony's thinking at this point, but most statisticians at this point sort of say, well, um, what we, you've not done a very good sampling. Um, what you actually want to do is fill in uh, parameter space, and you certainly don't want to take all these extremes. Um, you really should do a sampling that, that goes, uh, uh, that is a better sampling, some Latin hypercube or something like that to explore um, parameter space, uh, and then, um, then fill it in. So, and this is what a number of, uh, of people have done, um, partly with, with some better sampling techniques, but partly with the use of statistical emulators, say, okay, our models are doing that at this point in parameter space, uh, we're, going to use, we're going to build a statistical emulator, we're going to fill parameter space, um, and then we're going to take that distribution. So that's now going to be our probability distribution. Now, uh, lots of you are, are, are philosophers. This just seems loony uh, to me. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> so the, as a starting point, uh, th th this is the foundation of the UK climate projections from 2009. This is the method that they use, and we'll come back to that uh, in a moment. It's the underlying method. There's lots more that goes on, but that's a, that's a kind of starting point. So you have a distribution in parameter space. The problem is parameter space is not well defined. Have I got it in this? Um, in fact, parameter space is, is somewhat arbitrary. There are lots of parameters here that are used for the, within the parameterization schemes. They're made to sound as though, relate to, as though they relate to physical quantities, but, um, but really they don't. So if you think about, uh, if I take one of the cloud schemes, you have something called the ice fall rate, which is how quickly ice falls out of clouds. So there are a number of issues there. Um, is it an ice fall rate or is it an ice residence time? One is the inverse of the other. If you're a good computer programmer, you will choose one over the other as a more efficient way of solving uh, your equations in a numerical sense. But that will invert, <laughs> so, so if you, you, it will fundamentally change the shape of parameter space. Not a little bit, a lot. You're going to squash huge areas into uh, a small area. So if, uh, this is just a sort of illustration. If you've got a good sample uh, in parameter space there, and actually you've got your three parameters, you can put the same argument for convection parameters here. Yeah, each is the inversion of the other. You now find that actually what you're doing is concentrating it to, uh, everything down here. There's no reasonable prior, there's no objective prior to say what parameter space should, should look like. And that goes through to model space as well, which is even more sort of arbitrary. What, what is the shape of possible relevant models? Um, so th this is essentially the, the uh, more conceptual problem of, of the independence problem. It's not just a matter of we only sample there, it's the fact that we have a fundamental arbitrariness to uh, the shape of parameter space. There's also issues of um, what do these parameters mean. So we talked about the ice fall rate, but this is an ice fall rate to represent clouds within a grid box that maybe is 50 or 100 kilometers square in a model. People haven't gone out, or maybe they have now actually gone out and measured the, the rate at which ice falls out of clouds, but really there's no reason to expect that to be particularly related to the parameter within a model to represent clouds on, on, the, on a 100 kilometer uh, grid box. The, these two things are different. The, there's just, it's not something you can go out and measure. Um, and even more fundamentally, even if this wasn't an issue, why would a distribu distribution over such parameters represent our uncertainty in uh, a physical extrapolation of, of the, the real world climate system? I just don't get why I would want to make that relation, but maybe yeah, someone. Okay. Uh, so I agree with. Are you oh. <laughs> For the sake of the recording, I so I agree with you, one hundred and twenty percent, if I can. <laughs> um, in fact, what you call a non-discountable envelope is what my literature would call the identification region, okay. or the identified mm -hmm. set. And mm -hmm. you just, the envelope is what it is, and those are the things that are feasible, and you don't go be beyond that. That's, mm -hmm. so, that, that's fine. But uh, obviously someone's been giving you trouble, <laughs> and saying that you I'm should. sensitive, am I? <laughs> yeah, so, so who, who is it who is telling you to do the loony thing of, uh, putting a distribution uh, and thinking of this as a sampling process, which I agree with you makes no sense whatsoever. But since you seem to be riled up about it, someone <laughs> must have been telling you to do that. So, so what's, what's your experience? 
Um, let me go on to the next slide. Okay. Okay. No, no, it's okay. The next slide will kind of kind of address your point. Okay. So, so there was quite a lot of work in this in in the two thousands and an effort to try and address this issue. Um, the statisticians were very keen on um, this kind of emulator approach, uh, and um, they also use a, a Bayesian uh, um, methodology, the application of Bayes' equation. <laughs> I don't think, as far as I can tell, it has no relation to Bayesianism in the sense of this is a subjective belief, but it's a, uh, but it's a process that, that they've used. Um, and it became very important within what termed the UK climate projection. So, um, in the UK, uh, the UK government uh, asked the UK Met Office to provide projections um, of the climate of the 20th, 21st century, and this is what they did, and they used this method. And um, some people have been critical of it, but they still use this method and are using it again uh, for a revamp of these uh, projections um, next year. Um, th this, there's a lot more to what they do. There's, there's weighting stuff, but underlying it was, was this, this method. Um, and it was used to produce, um, they assign probabilities to different future climate outcomes. There's, there's issues about quite whether they assign probabilities, but they claim to assign probabilities in some sense. And they produce these sorts of plots where uh, this is the wettest day in summer in one scenario. We're looking at the 90% probability level um, of, in, of uh, the wettest day in summer uh, changing, has it gone up by between 10 and 20% or between 30 or 40%? Well, they use this, this kind of method to, to get some sort of distribution and then uh, use a downscaling method to get uh, that distribution on this sort of scale. So where I live is here in Oxford. And I mentioned Milton Keynes here. Milton Keynes is over, is over here. The resolution of these grid is about 25 kilometers. Milton Keynes is talking about a 30 to 40 percent increase in the wettest day in summer. Oxford is talking about a 10 to 20 percent. So if you're building a uh, storm drain, you're building a new housing estate, you're putting in storm drains. If you've got this information, you may well want to uh, design your drains differently in Milton Keynes than from Oxford. Now, for the reasons I've just said, I wouldn't believe. Uh, that information on on much larger scale, I certainly wouldn't believe it on on this sort of scale. But this is the sort of information which is being looked for for climate services to to, to guide decisions. So there is, in some sense, a, a battle going on, or that needs to go on, about how we provide information about future climate to support decisions. Uh, and and I don't want to name names or organisations, but but those people with big computers. Kind of, it's, it's, it's easy then. If you run a computer, you'd go, run it through a method, you've got these outputs, you've done your job. Now it's up to you, decision makers, to, to sort it all out. Um, it's messier. The alternative is a lot messier to say, well, actually, we can't, don't have that, but we've got some information here, we've got some information there. That's what makes it tricky. How long have I got? Five minutes. OK. OK. Um, so there are some other issues. What about excluding or downweighting models? Well, that kind of, I'll, I'll rush through these a little bit. Um, that, that raises a question of how close to uh, reality do models have to be to make relative weighting meaningful? Or how bad is a, does a model need to be to not be considered? So this comes back to, to this sort of plot. It's very, very easy to rule out all of these models as inconsistent with reality. At the same time, they all encapsulate uh, really interesting interactions between different physical processes that can help us understand those physical processes. So they're really useful tools. On the other hand, if you're trying to uh, statistically process them to get some PDF out, well, they're just so far away that the probability of consistency with observations is so uh, small I think we did calculate it for some of them. It's 10 to the minus 5, 10 to the minus 6 or something. The idea of weighting a model that is consistent with observations at the 10 to the minus 5 level more, a lot more, than one that is uh, weighted at the 10 to the minus 7 level 
just seems a bit loony um, to me. So, so it doesn't seem to me appropriate to, to weight models by, of, or by observations. Uh, and I'm not going to, but it does raise a question of um, how close to the real system do we need models to be to make probabilistically relevant predictions in this extrapolatory situation? And that's someone which, uh, 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 something that, that um, Roman Frigg and, uh, and, and, and Lenny Smith and uh, was, was Seamus, were you involved in? I can't, yeah, and Seamus has, uh, been, sorry, uh, has been involved in, but I'm not going to talk about that because uh, I'm running out of time, um, but, but they can talk about that. Um, um, so there's a further problem in uh, excluding or downweighting, which is the in-sample problem again. Now this is then a conflict between um, the physics and the statistics. If you are a physicist and you get this sort of distribution, what you might want to do is look at, look at these. Look at these that warmed up a, a lot and that maybe ones that decreased in precipitation and ones that really increased in precipitation and try to understand where the, what are the processes? How did that come about? That, that's a very reasonable physic, physical uh, response to, to ask those questions. On the other hand, if you look at these and find that they are inconsistent with observations in some sense, that there is some fault in them, there's a tendency then to say, ah, you had said that the sensitivity, that they, we could get this really big response, but now we've shown that those are rubbish. So, so, um, so, so no, we, we've now reduced our uncertainty. But you can't do that. Then, then, you're, in, then you're in the realm of the statistic, uh, a statistical interpretation here. You, because you've looked at it in sample, you've chosen those, afterwards and, uh, and, 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 uh, and then looked at them. And this is exactly what has, has happened in the literature. Um, I don't, this is just a distribution for the same sort of plot, but it's a distribution for some um, uh, climate variable where we have some sort of extremes of change. And what, what people have done um, uh, is in these papers, they've looked at those, they've found out why you get these extreme behaviors and why that can't happen in reality. In practice, there have been other simulations since that come into this, this, uh, uh, this region. Um, but the point is that that presentation is, the, the presentation of, of that analysis is not just this is the process, but that the claim that uh, this is a possibility has now been ruled out. So we get an in-sample problem. And the question is, how do we, how do we address that? Because these are not, this is not a situation where you can just go out and get more data. Running these ensembles, the, 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 the models change every five years. Um, running them is a huge computational task. You can't just get more data uh, for these. So I think that's something actually that the community really needs to address. We need to think about defining our analysis procedures and what we might consider acceptable before we start looking at the data, ideally before we even run the models, so that we can say uh, uh, beforehand, we are not going to accept models that, that fail to do this. Then you've got something robust to say, OK, <laughs> we'll, we're going to take all those out. Um, similarly, it might be good to hold back data on big ensembles like this. Don't provide it all. Provide some of this data. Uh, but hold some back that you can then look at uh, after you've, you've analysed the first set. Um, OK, so what are we left with? Well, I, I think, for me, we're left with this non-discountable non envelopes of possibility. If the models have any direct value in predicting uh, regional uh, local changes, then we are left with them providing a non-discountable envelope of possibility. Um, but in that case, the aim of the modeling exercise should be to push out those bounds. So this is my, this is kind of how I see it, and I don't know if it really makes sense. So this is a, this is, uh, I'm just very in, interested in your views. Um, but my view would be what you want to do is perhaps build in, in these sorts of experiments, is you do, you build an em emulator to try, uh, to the results that you have, to try to find what regions of parameter space, what regions of model space do really different things in the variables that you're interested in. And then run your models in those places. And your emulator may or may not be a good predictor, but that doesn't really matter. It just helps you to try and push out those bounds of, of uh, possibility within the model. And it's where we find that we can't push the model. That's where I think we start to say, actually, we, we, maybe we can get some confidence from from what directly from what we're getting from the model, not just from a physical understanding of that, but directly from the model saying, it does appear that the 
this, this type of system just can't go into those parts of response space. Then I think we're talking about something that where we get real great confidence. Um, and I guess because we're coming to end, it's worth highlighting, you know, all of these are warming. <laughs> All of them are warming, they, and uh, though it's not shown here, the regional warming in northern Europe, in, in the Mediterranean basin, on land, is always greater than the global warming, because it would. Land warms more than the ocean, um, higher latitudes warm more than, um, than uh, lower latitudes. These are good physical reasons, and you see it in all models. Um, they're also good physical reasons why they all show increasing rainfall in northern Europe. Um, so those are things that I would really trust. And then I think I'm pretty much out of time, yeah? And I think I just had quite a lot of waffly extra points, um, which are not really relevant. OK, thank you. Thank you. Um, I can put it in different ways. I mean, one, uh, maybe, maybe the point of the question is to ask to what degree could one, would it make sense to introduce something like devil's advocate models? So, uh, in a way, based on the idea where these models may be, even as a herd or cohort, may all have some overfitting. They have certain conceptual commonalities. They all maybe try too much to fit the past century or half century or so. So, um, devil, devil's advocate model would be one where you accept it, is, it doesn't fit the data well, but in some way you can say, well, it catches some patterns which may extrapolate well in the future or capture something in the future, but, uh, well, it, it's not crazy, but it's clearly underperforming if I was just to, to have to pick the best model. It's kind of some outlier, some whistleblower also, something which says I could have a different view. For instance, you could say it has to be simple and so on. If it's simple, it already would have, we couldn't fit that well, but if you get basically it, you, you specifically, deliberately ask, okay, how, what would I have to change in order to get some crazy prediction? How far do I have to go from what I can observe? Yeah, okay. I, 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 I think that would be very useful, yeah. Um, I, I think that's kind of pushing out the envelope uh, idea. I think that's, that's, uh, that, that's a, a good approach. Um, yeah, um, I think there is a, for, for big complicated models like these, um, they tend to be developed by national modelling agencies, or maybe if not developed by national modelling, there they tends to be an element that they have a they're the national model. Um, so there's uh, EC Earth, which is a, a European model, as a had GEM, which is a UK model, as a two or three um, uh, American models, and. Um, <coughs> My impression, I'm not sure I have data to back this up, but my impression is that national governments want to use their national model, <laughs> um, which kind of makes sense. You're kind of trusting your own people, your own scientists. But the consequence of that is that this isn't, this collection of models are not models designed in any way to achieve some scientific purpose as a collection. Nobody wants a real outlier. The real outlier might be the most useful thing, thing for the science, but it's going to be the least useful thing for guiding national policy. Uh, so, so you can understand that there may well be a push towards uh, having models that are in a, in a sort of central zone. Um, and I... I mean, kind of as I've shown here, this idea that all these models show, show warming and, and other features come out, I think, I, I think we'd actually see, it would just be another line in the argument of just how robust the confidence in uh, anthropogenic climate change and its disruption to society is, if, if we had more diverse <laughs> models. Um, so yes, I agree. I agree. Hi. Um, so I have t two sort of very quick qu points. I mean, one is uh, there's a worry that, you know, when you're offering these non-discountable envelopes to, to policymakers, they might sort of misinterpret them, right? So they might go, oh, okay, these are the, you know, the we only have to worry about states that fall within this envelope, 
right? Whereas what you want them to be thinking is we have to make sure that our plan is at least adaptable, you know, to these possible futures and possibly more. Right, so you don't want them to sort of misinterpret the, the non-discountable envelope as sort of a maximum range of the uncertainty. And the, 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 other, the other just sort of quick point I wanted to make, or the question I wanted to ask is, you know, at the end you said, what we really want to do is uh, try and push the envelope and find the parts of the, the response space, I think you called it, that do seem to be inaccessible, where the climate's not going to go. But, you know, that, that sort of, how much pushing of the envelope do we have to do before we can become <laughs> confident that it's not going to go there in any possible um, So on, on, on that second point, um, it, I think it's... So it's often said when we take these uh, simulations uh, going forward that it's accepted that these, the, these probability interpretations aren't necessarily the best thing to do, uh, that we have uh, other understanding, um, but the, the counter tends to be, but what else can we do? We've got to provide information. Um, or, 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 or worse, this is the best, this, this is our current knowledge. It seems to be uh, criticisms tend to be interpreted as uh, a concern about black swans, that there may be something else uh, that, that could happen. That is not my concern at all. Uh, there may be black swans. I don't care about those. What I care about is what we understand at the moment not being incorporated in, in what we use. So I think this idea of, of how much do we need to explore before we're confident, uh, in a certain sense, if we've done it right, which we probably won't have been done, but if we've done it right, it will be encapsulating uh, our best knowledge today. And okay, you might want to leave it because I'm leading to repeat the first part. <laughs> um, if they encapsulate our best knowledge today, that's, that's all. We've, we've, we, it's reasonable to use that. It's also worth saying that I don't think it's, I don't think it's difficult to get quite a wide range of behaviour. So um, in terms of, of responding to... Oh, it, it's a little bit like knowing that we have the big climate change problem. So I think one of the concerns I have is that there's sometimes a focus on trying to get the optimal economic response given uncertainty and climate sensitivity. That's OK up to a, a point, but actually we just know enough that we, need, we know we need to be doing an awful lot more to protect our future, it doesn't actually matter that because <laughs> we just just how what the optimal level is. We just need to be doing a lot more. And in a similar level for at the adaptation level, I think we'll find that um, the the models will tell us that we need to be doing a lot, uh, and it will be a gradual focus, a gradual seep of information into the science to say, okay, you can't go here or you can't go here. Um, what was your first point? I can't. So the, the first point was just to worry about possible misinterpretation of by the policymakers of the envelope, saying, "Oh, yeah. there is no risk; we could go outside." Whereas yeah. this is not your your yeah, interpretation. Yeah, I think this, uh, the response is kind of the same. I think they will be so big that um, uh, that that's not really a concern of mine. Though I do often, I have sometimes presented this in terms of saying, "Well, if you've got some skeptic or." Whoever, if somebody comes along and says, well, actually, uh, I think the change is going to be here. Well, basically none. Or maybe it, it's, uh, they're just going to have a slight decrease in temperature. And okay. So how would I respond to that? Have I ruled that out? No, I haven't ruled that out, as you've, uh, uh, as you've said. Um, my response would be, well, this experiment, the information I have, says you shouldn't discount anywhere within that envelope. I have no knowledge about the plausibility out here. And if you've got somebody telling you that it's here, you need to assess their evidence for, for thinking that it's going to be there. I, in this experiment, I have no, no knowledge about that. Now, 
separately as a scientist, I would say, actually, I don't think it can be there <laughs> because of energy balance issues. But that's not from this uh, interpretation. Thank you very much.